And so, Taro's wild ride hit its last stop. Near is a kindness after <coughs> playing through Drakengard. It's not that the older games are unplayable, just... Anyway, Near is very good. It's the spin-off series spawned by a joke Drakengard ending that, I think, let Taro and his team make something truly unique, even if some of the brilliance was incidental. It's the most amazing thing. You look at Drakengard with its apocalyptic scenarios, its fundamental fissures between Earth's inhabitants, and you get a crumb of kindness from the boy. Okay... But Nier's in that juicy, stark, picturesque post-apocalypse state in both games. It's the echoes of the remnants of ancient conflict, small lives living, natural beauty. It's the most fertile ground for a series of genuine human stories. For a well of tears. So let's get real sad. But first, the tedium. Nier, Gestalt, not the Japanese version with the shonen pro tag, sets up a dangling tragedy shared between a dad and his daughter, marooned in a faded urban snowscape beset by mysterious monsters. Buddy draws power from a magical sentient book whose aid dispels the threat, and we flash into a totally different setting with a lot of questions and two familiar faces. The player walks into a quaint pastoral life lived in service to saving his daughter, who's terminally ill with the Black Scrawl. It's small, it's warm, it's really surprising how badly the game scored in the West, but I I guess launching next to industry titans is never a good look for this kind of thing. Like a used bookshop built beside a mall. But ooh, ooh, you feel that? That's the feeling of adventure! Look, coming off Drakengard, this controls like heaven. I'm sorry. At a glance, gameplay is what you'd expect. Explore barren zones, kill monsters, collect materials, complete side quests, level up, do the dungeons, beat the game. The basic points aren't new, and I bet that's the problem. I mean, ah! sake, gamers, didn't anyone tell you not to judge a book by its cover? It's the kind of game that hides its value behind completion, and like Drakengard, unlocking cutscenes. But you'd miss the weight of the game's tragedy without experiencing it yourself. Veterans will know what I mean. Not that they're around anymore. Granted, it's questionable design if the media only gets good after the, uh, first season, right? But a lot of it is meaningful, and I have issues with a few typical criticisms near gets anyway. Though I know it's not perfect. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Where's the text? Where's the text? You know what? Put a pin in all that? We gotta work our way up to spoilers. Let's talk boring. <laughs> Might be best to call the game flow repetition and service. You're a lowly RPG man with a little baby sword. You'd better believe them farm animals will crush your kneecaps if you come hoof hunting. But everything you do, boring as it can be, fetch questing, gathering, running, and talking, run on boars! Aw oh, yeah, dude, that's not old. Is all in service to Yona, your daughter. I mean, she needs medicine, you need money, make it happen, pal. It's rare that an RPG of this kind, like the fables, amalors, dragon's dogmas of the world, can meaningfully constrain the player. The former who don't believe in constraint, and in Dogma, it's mostly about destiny and level grinding. But Nier isn't a cynical game for gamers, right? Not some wild power fantasy. The entirety of the first half revolves around helping Yona, finding Yona, being a dad to Yona. It may be because I'm getting older, but this kind of story used to fall flat for me. And aging, collecting ailments and obligations, there's something deeply moving about this guy who only bothers to wake up to make another life better, only bothers to act for the person most important to him. In that sense, it's incredibly mature in comparison to its genre contemporaries. Damn it, layers of irony rapidly decreasing, vulnerability too high, more gamer irony stat! Hee hee, funny seal, hee hee, seal good. Nier has a lot of things to collect and upgrade, a lot of menial tasks to complete that were often lambasted as boring. All I can say is, you don't need to do any side quests at all to reach at least two of the endings, and there's definitely a cry in there somewhere. It's not so bad. And it's not all that difficult, levels are hardly the deciding factor in combat. Here's what you're gonna do, finish some story quests, sell all your junk, by Beast Bane, play through one solved, you're welcome. Though I'll admit, the joy of travel dies pretty quickly as the player runs from place to place to place. But I couldn't stop thinking about Yona, you know? Will Yona be okay the next time I see her? I don't trust Taro! I found it was successful at making me care through the blasé tasks and journeys. And for what it's worth, the world is gorgeous. Again, I'm kind of shocked at this notion that the world is ugly or whatever. It's a very stark and simple beauty, perfectly themed. And yes, the environments are lacking, they don't change meaningfully throughout the game. The bloom's a little strong, but that doesn't take away the good, right? Could have been better doesn't invalidate solid art direction. Okay, 
Okay, not all the time. Just stop, you've made your point! Honestly, the warts might make the fans love it more. If anything, it could use a few more. I mean, come on, when you fall from a cliff, Buddy lands on his ass like, oh, uh, whoopsie. Bro, if you fell like that in Dragon's Dogma, you'd end up looking like this. Don't give me that. I'll walk it off, bucko, you're 40! And now, for another system that gets dogged for no good reason. Except for the lack of lock-on, that's pretty inexcusable. Combat is important in Nier. It's how you solve problems, like most of these games. In fact, it's almost the only thing Papa Nier knows how to do. Traditionally, it's been decried as boring and repetitious and mashy. Are we playing the same game, bro? Get dumpstered! Okay, in truth, the combat isn't stellar. Surprisingly, it's not Devil Gaidenetta. I know. How crazy is that, right? Why isn't my action game literally just the greats of the past decade? Well, it turns out that isn't the game they were making, and overall it ended up with more uniqueness than the great pile of player aggrandizing action games, even if this particular system isn't mind-blowing. Reminds me of the main character, actually. Simple, methodical, some room for spice, but meaningfully constrained. Oh ho, is that... Is that mechanical narrative cohesion? Oh, I'm gonna cut! I was harsh on Fable forever ago, but I'm starting to think more in terms of what the game is, what the engine can reasonably do, what the devs did with what they had, and frankly, near is fun chunky, and has a degree of depth beyond whatever Drakengard was doing. I'd say that makes it pretty good. Melee swings are themselves, there's a couple of jump attacks, you can block, dodge roll, you can pull off meaty, magic-infused charge attacks. Options are limited, but they're not without purpose. What pulls the system together is magic, which I haven't even talked about Vice yet, we'll get to him in a minute, but the source of your magic is this talking book, and you can outfit him with different magical attacks, like an endless stream of bolts or a lance. Honestly, those are what I use for 99% of the game, but I think the other options look pretty cool too. And it's not inherently busted, most of it's limited by the bar, so you can't go insane with it until very late, by which point combat should be trivial anyway. Even the enemies, while not incredibly varied or anything, still bring a number of player damaging options to the battlefield, and you have to respect their quirks. If anything, I wish they'd gone harder on enemy variants and power, but I feel like the magic ball bullet hell enemies tend to put you through is a way to mitigate boredom and liven up encounters. Plus it just feels cool, like, like you feel like an action game shmovement master, you know? We even between balls, or you know, just block them. Eh. But how then will you efficiently damage the enemy? Is that decision making I see? The game also has boss enemies, but they're nothing really worth mention. I mean, you fight them so often and get so absurdly strong over the course of a couple playthroughs that they turn into regular enemies with bloated health pools. Nier is only really difficult when the player doesn't pack enough healing herbs or the camera isn't cooperating in certain big boss battles. It's a bit sad in a way, but there's so many options given to shrewd players. You're almost always capable of making your play totally safe, at least if you want to. I mean, by the end game, I was just mashing jumping strong attack with the spear. Just like Drakengard 3. Oh no. Last of the big gameplay building blocks are the dungeons, as you'd expect, but to be fair, they're fairly few and mostly inoffensive. I like the way the game changes perspectives frequently during gameplay. Like, they know they're not firing on all cylinders here, they know they're not making the next great 10 out of 10 action game, so they spice things up with novelty. Granted, it's a risky move. Gamers tend to get a little angry when something new pops up, especially if it's annoying or breaks the flow. Sometimes they succeed and sometimes they don't, but you for sure don't remember Nier as the game that kept changing perspective, and boy that pissed me off. They're harmless challenges. I especially like the ones in the Desert Temple that force you to avoid certain actions entirely, like no running, so you just do whatever this extremely anxious jump rolling trash is. <laughs> Guess I'm just built different. Except, uh, these long word sections. Ooh, don't want to act like a dumbass that hates reading, but uh, 40 minutes, huh? 40 minutes of text? Huh? Okay. Anyway, sorry, just did apologetics for seven minutes, but there was a reason for that. You know, if you think the story sounds cool and you want to play it yourself, and believe me when I say it's better left unspoiled, get out, get out, get the f cool, we're in spoiler territory now. Game on. Most of Nier's greatness is found in its setting, characters, and scenario. I've talked game world so far, but that ignores the foundation. The world is, indeed, a regressed dystopia, hence the apparent anachronism, you know, stun gun robots versus senor machete. It's quaint because there's almost nothing left, just clusters of humans clinging together for survival, creating homes, culture, persisting. Much of the pull I felt for the world originated in the relative otherworldliness of the setting, like the inexplicable magical orbs befitting a video game, and jarring shifts in period aesthetics that imply a great time abyss. And there is, in fact, a ton of lore that I have no plans to address, but the draw is palpable. And Nier's characters only do its world further justice. Papa Nier is my favorite character in years. He's one of the most humble, down-to-earth, mature protagonists I've had the pleasure to sit through dialogue for. I like the spice in his hardline need to fight for his daughter. He radiates 
it's this fanatical fervor anytime he lifts his sword for her. And man, this game is so good at putting you in his shoes through tons of scenes that have you mashing as hard as possible to save this render of a little girl, this non-existent person. It's brilliant, and I don't mean to insult the shounen version of Buddy here, I'm sure his Genki attitude being whittled away is powerful in itself, but I feel this man in my soul. Vice, the book, is fantastic, what a totally obnoxious aristocrat. The dynamic between him and Nier hits like Banjo and Kazooie had writers. I mean, how many games have a book as a party member? Can I get a top 10 books in gaming? Thanks? Kaine is originally the character I disliked, thinking, ugh, perving on women again? But then you read the lore and it's like, oh, I guess I am the asshole. Yeah. She's intersex? Is that a gaming first? And wears clothes that highlight her femininity so she's seen as a woman and not a monster. Ow, my heart. Oh, and she pops off more Mario's per sentence than me. Now pull your head out of your goddamn <laughs> and start f***ing helping us! Emil's also a bit of tragic genius, a kid who locked himself away on account of his Medusa eyes turning things stone, and in trying to help the party by gaining power, he turns into this thing. This scene just wrecks me, man. How can you take the dad out of Nier? Actually, looking at Twitter, it looks like there's plenty of reason to try Replicant. I love watching the party rehabilitate this kid into believing he's not a freak or a monster. His powers aren't a liability. Then Taro makes the kid petrify Kaine with the very powers she made him feel comfortable about. Okay. Okay, Taro, it's judgment day. Where are you hiding, you big rat? I love this cast. They're a party of relatively odd, cold, even inhuman beings that humanize each other strengthen each other through their adventures. It's powerful stuff, something a lot of RPGs fail at. But I think Taro and his writer pals look at the characters as people, vulnerable, scared people, like our species is, before looking at whatever weapon they wield, whatever role they're meant to fulfill in the party. I love how low-key but beautiful the story is. Except when it's not. Except when it's really not! The story hits so hard because of the effective build-up and breakdown the narrative weaves. Build up your party with more broken souls, build them all up with struggle and love, build up your foes as demons to kill, and strip every last Mamma mia. bit of your expectation away in a painful series of reveals and endings. I knew something was up when the shades were basically wisps, but blood like ticks. The big reveal is every person you've interacted with, everything you've ever fought for, was effectively false. Your false human created as part of the Gestalt project, which is a big pile of text, and the real humans, or what's left, are the shades you've been killing along the way. It even goes out of its way in Route B and on to recontextualize old scenes that now cast you and the humans as outright villains, almost deliberately misunderstanding and mistreating the shades. And these kinds of twists tend to fail because they tend to wag a finger at the player, like, how could you, you monster? How could you kill what was trying to kill you? But the entirety of the adventure is seeded with cultural confusion, othering, misunderstanding, understanding, the power of language in seeking to understand, and the culmination of these lingering threads isn't that the player is a bad person for doing what they had to, simply that because of the party's goals, ambitions, wants, they missed critical information, even couldn't understand what they were doing, and committed atrocities for it. They found meaning in each other, not the morality of their actions. They found purpose in those they cared about, and nothing else mattered. Nier doesn't openly condemn that, opting to bemoan the very real tragedy that is humankind. These false humans, shells, created their own cultures, developed personalities. I love how the game questions personhood and why this species is so apt to harm first, but in spite of that harsh truth, Love is eternal. So was Yona worth it? There are four endings, two of them wrecked me. Calling back Yona's soul is one of the most heart-wrenching player validations I've ever seen. And the famous ending, the final ending, is without any exaggeration, the ultimate way to end the game. I feel like it's a sin to even discuss, and any analysis I have will fall flat because you have to experience it yourself. You have to fight for it yourself, not watch, not hear, but do. And if you're planning on becoming a Taro cultist, you can buy a Replicant and play it how it was originally intended, but with spicy new combat stuff, or play the dad DLC on the original Western version. There's a lot to suck up. You can see where the fans sprout from. There's an old philosopher who once wrote that we live in the best of all possible worlds. That guy got dunked on, uh, righteously, for being a <laughs> idiot. But Taro's work here, beyond Drakengard, is that same rejoinder, that cynical, if true, cry, that, oh no, honey, world bad. But further than that, what inhabits the world is capable of great love and indescribable beauty. And there's hope in that world. Oh yeah, put angles in my video game. Reference Plato, my post-secondary yuppie think brains Oh, throbbing!
Nier Automata is too much to cover in my format. Maybe that'll convince the last of you chuckle chums to try it out, huh? It's a hard game to write about. You know, usually it's turn on the Mario music, have a go! But it resists comment. We circle one another, glistening blades drawn in a deadly waltz. It's aware. It's better than me. This is embarrassing. Automata received such rave reviews as and quickly became a sort of modern epic. It's a fascinating game in terms of scope, a full-length adventure, beautifully animated, masterfully varied, yet totally contained in a relatively small set of zones, screens, some of the most depressing texture work I've ever seen. But that's just it. Those are the granular details. They're secondary. It's the focus on the player, the enemy, the interaction, the conflict, the search for humanity in the most base of human behaviors, and highlighting performance performance over fidelity in a less flowery sense. The scenario is openly dystopic. More than the previous game, the Earth's been invaded by an alien species and their machine life forms, mankind's remnants were driven to the moon, and the Yorhai units, the androids, are humankind's last bastion in the face of total annihilation. It makes a pointed effort to dehumanize the machines at the start, and hey, it's a Taro game, believe whatever you want, but the candy player knows when they're being strung along and especially coming off near. It's not hard to see what the writers are playing at. Androids, like the protagonist 2B, Deuteragonist 9S, and eventual torchbearer A2 are also constructs, also inherently inorganic, so wherefore cometh the motion, huh? Wherefore? But the facade's maintained as long as possible as the player interacts with the last remaining Earth humans, doing light chores in exchange for RPG, not immediately genociding the village of pacifists robots and getting to know the world. It's a good world. I mean, okay, it's mildly crumbling, but the views, the aesthetics, even takes the time to inject humor, life into something that is, by all metrics, a war zone. Look at this big boy. Look at this beautiful boy. It's a world that's sometimes welcoming, frequently aloof, and often openly hostile. What? <laughs> This is a horror game! But a world you come to know very well over three character playthroughs. Part of that intimate knowledge is the bladed dance you subject nearly every extant being to. I kind of appreciate Taro's commitment to combat. I get the sense this game's very much open to the old Bioshock Infinite line of why did this game have to be insert genre where you kill things? But Taro's work ensures that the follies of humankind are highlighted in its combat. Most of the violence in the main game is justified as in service of Earth's reclamation. And it becomes pretty apparent pretty early that almost none of it is in any way good or meaningful. But there's always a tougher enemy and an empty XP bar. Get slashing. I haven't listened to Action Game Masters discuss the mechanics, but as a DMC and Ninja Gaiden full series experiencer, I was surprised by what Automata's core felt like. Always assumed it was going to be a big budget, serious business action extravaganza, but it doesn't quite feel like it's uh, adjacent. Mind you, it's shooting past the first. Still, combos are fairly mashy and repetitious. You can do a few variations of the main attack pattern, but very few. The dodge window is absurdly generous, granting invincibility and movement. You have ranged options in the pod, so you're always laying down gunfire or missiles, at least if you're playing optimally and your pod has special moves. Pick one, it doesn't matter. And aside from a couple of little extras or character-specific actions, combat really does boil down to quick melee, incredibly strong mobility, and infinite range damage fire with impunity. However, the complicating factors with enemies are numerous. They often blast those orbs from range until they're dead, and fail that do a lot of close range flailing, or more specifically, mobile active hitboxes. In a game with no guard button, what this means is the novice will walk in and take a ton of damage, realize they have good mobility and range tools, and eventually play passive until they learn, if they ever learn. The problem's compounded by the absurd flashes and flares of gunfire, slash sparks, a lot of junk detracts from visibility. It's kind of crazy to me because the combat, I find, is a lot of fun, and almost nothing about it is asking players to have fun. Except for that generous dodge button, whose enormous invincibility makes a lot of sense given how many hitboxes you're often bullied by, and the incredible animations that really give 2B and friends life and expression. It rewards Flash, but leans passive. That's the funniest trick of it all. I've heard the game's combat is boring a few times, and figured out what was meant by that, but the entire game, and why I feel comfortable dumping this giant combat talk right after the premise, is about discovering humanity, inventing purpose, turning nothing into something, and that core conceit is, once again, baked into the mechanics. You have to build your android, okay, with those chips. At first I hated that myself, I wanted a functioning character. I didn't want to do Taro's work for him, so the game just worked. 
But that's not the point. It's building a character you can be proud of that does what you want it to do. You pick your weapons, pick your pod fire type, pick your special pod cooldown ability. Yeah, you can play the game as boring as possible. You can also load into Smash Ultimate's quick play on Wi-Fi, pick Samus and camp projectiles, Pole, you can do a lot of things. Automata's combat can be boring, or you can choose something enjoyable and choose to have a pulse. There's auto heal and life drain chips available. Okay, you don't have to be a mewling Melvin forever. Fucking live a little. Holy God, that was beautiful. And it's really not that tough. Yeah, it's got growing pains, but you'll settle in. You'll be dodging attacks left and right, dancing through balls. It'll be great. Just uh, make sure you install the post damage iframes chip. Okay, number one. Oh, yeah. The game holds tight to the tradition of mixing gameplay segments and perspectives. I will say the focus on these in Nier and Automata is a tacit admission that combat isn't the most important thing to the devs, or rather, it's not what the game's resting its hat on like with other action games. And they do, like before, get annoying at times or drag too long, but again, they add flavor to something that might have been a lot more boring, a lot mashier. Often they allow the player to rest their thumb. My thumb says thank you. And variants, perspective, are key to a game that flits between characters that asks the player to empathize with various tribes and motivations. You're asked to run through three routes to complete the five major endings, because they did one for every letter of the alphabet, and they're like 99% jokes. Uh, and it's an interesting, if bizarre, way to handle story progression. 2B sets the base, runs through all the major events, and, spoiler alert, hits a minor snag. The game, not confident enough or unwilling to share more until it's sure you understand, puts you in 9S's shell, a character with fewer attacking capabilities, but a heavy reliance on this stupid <laughs> hacking minigame to do optimal AoE damage. So I'm not really a fan of that, I'll admit, but you can simply choose to kite scum almost every humanoid boss. Ooh, better touch up your micro, you dumb bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and you run through most of the same events from his slightly varied perspective, occasionally doing some differing tasks. I wouldn't be shocked if 9S killed whole playthroughs with average to annoying combat, totally, absurdly obnoxious hacking sections, seriously, some of these are rage-inducing garbage, and certain extreme lows in game flow, particularly this segment where you first encounter status ailments, which you probably didn't buy curatives for because they didn't exist prior. So anyway, there's a difficulty slider. It's almost like they wanted the gameplay to match his story of, uh, Jokerfication. I guess that's good design. A2 lets the game sing again, allowing the player to reclaim normal combat and the narrative, wherein a cynical murder droid, self-assured in her righteousness, has her ideas tested, battered again and again. It's really no wonder that infamous article cropped up discussing Automata as effectively torture porn, because while it's wrong, you wouldn't know that if you didn't get to the true ending. Some of the segments are cartoonishly depressing, almost embarrassingly so, if they weren't followed by immediate justification. But the game's edge is often sickly ironic parody. So what you'd expect from the human race. Behold, the tragedy of Pascal, pacifist machine with his village of robots. He cares about children and can fly 10 billion feet in the air. Okay, there he goes. <laughs> I guess you could say his people needed him. Watch as his village is torn apart by Zombots. Watch as he confronts the army of flying tanks with his hijacked Gundam. Watch as the children he saved kill themselves because he taught them what fear is. Yeah, it's okay, pal. I'll wipe your memory. Oh, by the way, uh, you didn't need them junk baby parts, huh? Because I need, like, two robot baby legs so the great forest blacksmith Masamune can forge a max-level weapon. Hey, thanks again, bro. For the baby legs. Aside from tragedy, the game's masterful at delivering these uncanny, infectious, neurotic fever dream cutscenes. So much of it serves to cast the robots as alien by virtue of their burgeoning humanity. It's like near in that sense, the immediate response some cynic has to robots gaining consciousness is, well, they're not programmed to have emotions, but that's literally the point of the work. Ugh. Without spoiling everything, the game's still relevant. Automata infuses much of the human experience into a pair of opposed, non-human factions, fighting a proxy war over bygone gods. It hits that same note as Drakengard 1. The human species is beyond repair, but there's an ineffable value in its potential. Mankind is made idle to both factions in the end. Mankind becomes as gods. Everyone else is dust. I don't have much to say about the endings. Four of them are tied to playthrough completion, with a secret unlockable one, but the game doesn't resist it like Nier. You can just chapter select. 
A plus, guys. But let's cut to the point. The Nier games put you in the role of someone with expectations on their shoulders. They make you work through a world that's pernicious and cruel and disaffected, often starkly inhuman, otherworldly despite the familiar setting. Characters suffer losses, the enemy is always encroaching, and the characters cling to one another, support one another, and triumph in a world of many defeats and many fruitless victories. But there is beauty found in the loss, in the hollow wind. There is beauty found in the space once thought void. Nihilism does not succeed in automata. Nihil, or nothing, does not succeed in near. Emil lives, people atone, self-erasure is meaningful. I hate leaving videos without points, without bows, without the so what. I want to make good works that say something. And you know, for near, I got nothing. Nothing at all. I think you'll have to play it for yourself. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good, thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Andy Blarg Azero Basement Dweller Boha Brandon Brios Cal Can I cuss on here? Caesar T Cordant Chris A Cody Golden Corgi the Lad, Couch Moba, CW Glassworks, Kyle Lapreed, Daddy Dagoth, Dakota Storm Jones, Dondium, Danky Stank Swanky Make, Dara, David Castillo, Den Het, Dylan Coffee, LPO, Annex, Aesthetico, Exa, Frankenstitch, Glyph Seeker, Guard Corey, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Harkaj, Heman Gaming Station, Huey, Ingenious Clown, Irradiated Cherries, Ice Kyle, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jason Lasky, Jaden, J. Deus, John, John Weber, Joke Frog, Keegan Too Cool, Keith Myers, Clocked. Crayden, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Loki, Lawn, Lucas Boyd, Magical Madman, Markules, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Milky Moo Official, Michelanius, Mr. Dodongo, Nito Torpedo, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, Quasar McDougal, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Ricochet Frame, Sagit Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Sekai Noah Warida, Shod, Simp God, Slagathor, Sleepy Wabbit, Special Children, Spooky Grimalkin, Squishword, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Katsanova, Super Sandwich Guy, TFY Lex, The Big Bubby, The Salt Knight, Thrips Heartrop, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, V01156, Vid, Venom, Vice Pup, Viewers Like You, Vic, Walter Taggart, Waposa, Weeb Trash, well, shit. Yay, Kundo! Zachary V. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zyberbunk. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.